Good start. Huh? It's been a long time since I've been in person, so I'm a little out of practice, but it's really nice to be here with y'all tonight. I'm Bobby Chesney. I'm a professor at the School of Law, but more importantly for tonight's purposes, I'm the director of the Strauss Center for International Security and Law here at the University of Texas. We have a lot of different programs at the Strauss Center. Two of them are coming together tonight, really three, actually. One of them is our Journalism and World Affairs program, where we try to uh, connect uh, those students at UT who are interested in journalism from the international and national security perspectives with uh, you know, thought leaders like Chris. And about to hear. Another is our cybersecurity program, which brings together uh, students from a variety of different disciplines. If we, our goal is for the business students to understand the legal framework, for the law students to understand the technical details, for the computer science and engineering students to understand the policy framework, and so on around the horn. But a third program I want to mention is our Brumley Graduate Fellows Program, which is made possible by the generous support and philanthropy of John and Becky Brumley. It's a really cool program because it's not subject matter specific. For every one of our subject matter programs, we hold a spot open for a grad student who can come from any program on this campus. By the way, the application for the next year's class is open now and it's <laughs> open until April 1st. We pick one student from whichever program they come from. And one student is assigned for each one of our programs. And among the other things the students get involved in, they get to think of the person in this world they'd most like to meet on their subject matter. And then we try to bring that person to campus to give a talk to the public, but also to meet one-on-one -on -one with the student to talk about their research and to meet with the other Brumley fellows to talk about career paths. And it's, it's I think, one of the neatest things we do. So I'm very excited that our Brumley graduate fellow, Alex Rhodes, who's about to come up here, uh, who, is, who is a Master of Public Affairs student here at the LBJ School, but also a very talented musician, a sixth generation Texan, very impressive, and, and uh, a really interesting work background as well before coming to LBJ. She's working on disinformation and the way that disinformation is impacting our discourse here in this country. And when we talked about who we might bring in, she had a really good idea. So I'm going to turn the floor over to Alex now. And Alex will come up and introduce our guest. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bobby. We're now on a first name basis after my podcast episode with him. So uh, very fancy. Um, it is my honor tonight to introduce Christopher Krebs. He was the very first director of the Department of Homeland Security's Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA. Um, you may know this, one of the big things they do is election security. So you may have heard his name um, around and maybe all will get into some of that. Um, that was a big part of it. Um, after leaving his office, he joined uh, former Facebook CISO, Alex Stamos, and started a cybersecurity consulting agency. Their very first client, client was SolarWinds after that whole rigmarole about a year ago. So without further ado, um, thank you so much for being here and thank you for the kind introduction. All right, wow. All right, I think I got it. All right, thank you. Thanks, it's great to be back. It was uh, actually January, 2020. Uh, I was here at the Strauss Center speaking to uh, one of Bobby's classes, and then also the Cyber 912 event as well. And uh, it wasn't my last trip before the pandemic, but it was 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 the best. We can say that. Uh, and it, you know, the intervening two years have uh, we've learned a lot about cybersecurity, elections, disinformation, pandemics, uh, Russian invasions. And so what, what I think I'll do today is kind of tell you a little bit about uh, my thoughts of what's going on in, uh, in Ukraine right now. And Russia is a formidable uh, operator in the cyber attack space. You know, what happened? Uh, but first, probably a comment. Um, baseball, I think they got the deal. So let me start working on walk-up music. Was there a, yeah, 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 for the, things like that. So so you, you probably want to rush. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so I, I did a briefing um, Tuesday, Tuesday evening, it is Thursday, like Tuesday evening, I did a briefing to a number of house members, and uh, I, the, the idea here was uh, they get a number of different perspectives, they get civilian agency perspective, they get state and local perspective, 
they get uh, intelligence community perspectives. Uh, but you know, what I wanted to do is help them understand what we were seeing from a consulting perspective. We have a number of multinational companies that are out there in the world that, that operate in Ukraine, that operate in Russia. And some of the challenges that they're seeing, not just from a uh, information security perspective, but also a geopolitical perspective. What are some of the risks now that companies are facing, not just of operating in Russia, but choosing to withdraw from Russia? What are the risks that are introduced, not just from people saying, hey, I'm going to retaliate, but all of a sudden you pulled back your digital maintenance plans on a piece of equipment that's still operating in Russia and things break and they don't know how to fix it anymore. So what are the espionage pieces going to be? So we're trying to help Congress, and this was members of the House of Representatives, kind of look around corners a little bit. Because we, we continue, particularly if you watch the news every day, uh, it, it tends to focus on what's happening today or what, what meetings might be happening in the next couple of days. And, and, and my sense of things, and this is talking to intelligence community members, but also uh, politicians and other government officials here and elsewhere is that we're 15 days in um, and it's just devastating and horrific as, as it is th thus far. Uh, it, it certainly looks as if there's no immediate uh, ending in sight that, that, that looks good for, for just about anybody. So helping them understand what's next, what might be around the corner. And, and one of the tips, one of the things that we're, we're talking as we talk to governments and, and, uh, and businesses is that you need to mentally set yourself up to think about this kind of like you did with COVID. So as I was running CISA, uh, the agency in, in the, the spring of 2020, um, and there was a lot of, hey, we'll be open by Easter, we'll be open by the 4th of July and all that. And, you know, when we had all hands calls with our team every, every week, and we would, would continually get that question, when are we going to be back in the office? And part of it was like, yay, I want to be back in the office. But a lot of it was like, I don't want to be back in the office. <laughs> so it, you, know, you had to manage expectations and the worst possible outcome was saying, let's, let's go two weeks, but every two weeks, let's revisit. And so what I just kind of set the expectation up front, I can't see us getting back in the office. Again, this is about April of 2020 until January of 2021. I just, we're calling the ball right now. It's going to take a long time. I kind of am getting that same sense right now with, with uh, Ukraine and Russia, particularly from a Russian economic perspective. It is going to be a long time before there's any sort of normalcy in terms of political engagement or economic engagement. So kind of back to the beginning here, talking about cybersecurity. There were, uh, you know, I think any, anyone would have looked at Russia's history of interventions in the West. So uh, Peter W. Singer's got a great uh, lecture on this and he talks about how the Russians have uh, interfered in 30 democratic elections in Europe and elsewhere, including the US over the last decade or more. Uh, you talk about the, the assassinations and uh, poisonings of political officials. Some of them fortunately, like Navalny survived, others were not so fortunate. But there has been a history of bad activity. And yes, that includes cyber attacks. Uh, 2015, 2016, the Russian GRU, the Military Intelligence Unit, also known as Sandworm, uh, launched two different attacks on the grid in Russia. Or I'm sorry, in Ukraine. They took it down just for a short period of time. But nonetheless, they have capabilities. They came here in 2016 and attempted to interfere in the 2016 US election. They have conducted other operations here in the US, collecting information, intelligence, compromising the State Department, the White House, and others, uh, as well as searching throughout uh, corporate networks in the energy sector, in the aviation sector, and the state and local governments for years and years and years. Very persistent, very skilled. And so it would only be natural that if there was a well planned, integrated, coordinated invasion of a foreign country, that cyber would play a role, that they would integrate that with their force packages. And that's not just speculation. They've done it before. 2008, when the Russians went into Georgia, they conducted website defacements and denial of service attacks against uh, Georgian government networks. 2014, last time, 
the Russians went in to Ukraine. Again, website defacements, denial of service attacks, other destructive attacks. And so there, there was a significant amount of anticipation and expectation that the Russians would bring a fully integrated package as they rolled in. So what happened? Well, it's almost as if some people are disappointed that there wasn't a whole lot of cyber. Uh, there was, there, in January, website defacements on Ukrainian government networks and uh, 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 financial services networks. Fast forward about a month, and there were, uh, there were denial of service attacks, and there were uh, wiper attack, attacks. So basically, it's ransomware without the unlock feature. So there were attacks. Some were attributed to Russia. Others were attributed to Belarus. Interesting that they're in league together. Others are kind of still in progress, still trying to understand who did it. But the real takeaway here is that the value of cyber operations is in the gray zone. It's everything that leads up to the bombs flying the bombs dropping and the bullets flying. Because once you're at that level of engagement with kinetic activity, disrupting, distracting, confusing, there are other ways to accomplish that once you've already crossed those lines. And that's where we are today. Could there be other attacks? There was a report over the, uh, over the weekend that Viasat, a satellite telecommunications, a broadband company was also disrupted and hit with some sort of destructive attack, probably a, a software supply chain uh, compromise. And there's probably other stuff too, but we don't know because businesses, government agencies, other networks in Ukraine, there aren't people at their desks. They've got their weapons, they're out in the field, or they've been displaced to Poland or elsewhere. So there could be other stuff. But also there's the fog of war. We have imperfect insight into these networks. So I think as time goes on, we'll, we'll probably see that there was more, but again, to put it in the context, these sorts of cyber operations are, are really not as effective as important when hu real human tragedy is happening. So as I mentioned earlier though, we're 15 days in this. We're still fairly early on and this unified approach from the Western governments to lay significant sanctions on Russia has had a pretty severe economic effect. There are some uh, assessments that are, you will probably start hearing about soon that the entire Russian economy could contract by anywhere from 10 to 20 to 30%. I, I suspect it's actually more than that. I think it's gonna be difficult for a number of these businesses to re-enter the market. And so once you start putting these pressures on where they have reduced access to a global economy and global goods and, and resources, when money isn't as freely available as you know, it used to be, when the ruble is effectively useless, you have a different set of conditions that inform how you act. And so as we look forward, particularly as companies that have come out assertively to say, we are not going to support this regime and we are out. Whether it's the, 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 the pure PR factor of it, or as I mentioned earlier, that dependency factor, risk is changing for organizations on a daily basis. Uh, also, if you have no other way of getting revenue and what work really well previously was ransomware. Ransomware may become, cybercrime may become something of economic necessity. And as a congressman said the other day, now you've got Russia that's a wounded bear and wounded bears can still hurt you. And so as those carefully calibrated red lines in times of peace, pre-conflict, as those calibrated lines change, the decision calculus for how you use your non-conventional, your unconventional and asymmetric capabilities going forward. As I mentioned, they've already poisoned 
and assassinated political figures in Europe. They've demonstrated they have a capability and willingness to use it. And once you start pulling the, the guardrails off, what does that mean? Particularly as the political climate, economic climate can, continues to deteriorate in Russia. So again, I think we're, we're still early. I'm not aware, I haven't talked to anyone that has a good sense of how this ends. Um, obviously the focus needs to be on supporting the Ukrainians as much as possible, getting them the humanitarian aid, the lethal aid support they need. Uh, but the world's a big place and there's going to be a lot of other activities going on in the meantime. And so we have a lot of work cut out. I think the government uh, has a, uh, a significant task on its hand, not just focusing on what's happening in Ukraine, but also being very clear that any sort of additional, you know, this destabilizing activity by the Russians is not going to tolerate, not going to be tolerated. I think to a certain extent they, they have good insight and intelligence on these, these hit squads and then assassination squads. And they need to eradicate those. They have a good sense of uh, some of the command and control infrastructure and the techniques that the, the Russians use. They need to cut back on that as much as possible. And that could include cyber command going into Russian networks and, and uh, making, making their jobs a little bit harder. But it's also, there's a role for the private sector, for businesses, that they have to step up, that we've been talking to them for 20 plus years about cybersecurity and how they need to take it seriously. And that it's not just a technical risk problem, it's not a digital risk problem, it's a business risk, but increasingly it's also a social responsibility requirement. By all these companies pulling out of Russia, doing the right thing, in my view, and that's what we advise our clients, right? get out while you still have a choice. So two weeks when everything's nationalized or whatever that timeline is, you're not going to be able to control who has access to your intellectual property. So you make the decision now. That's going to bring other consequences. You have to accept that. You have to accept that the world's different now. Uh, and you have time to make those decisions. So I think I'll wrap it up there. That's kind of a preview of, a, of an op-ed I wrote on the plane down here from DC too. <laughs> so um, it needs a little work, but, but I mean, it, it's, um, these are... These are dangerous times. Fantastic. Well, that tees up a lot for us to talk about. So y'all, what I thought we'd do is, uh, Chris and I'll have a bit of a moderated dialogue here for 15 minutes or so, but then be thinking about the questions you want to ask, because of course, the most fun of these events is, is when you get to raise your question. We'll get around to as many people as we can before we end at 6.30. Um, I want to start with ransomware. You mm -hmm. mentioned it a few times. You know, if, if we went back, went back about six months, Everyone's talking about it. It seems like the, the most pressing threat because we weren't thinking as much about immediate escalation risk out of the combat zone. But these things aren't unrelated since so many of the most prominent ransomware crews operate from safe haven out of Russia. And it was, it was really interesting in the run up to the actual invasion of Ukraine. There was a moment where Russia sort of flashily arrested some guys from the Weaver uh, ransomware crew. Uh, did you understand that to be an actual effort by Russia to do the right thing? Or was that more of a little bit of the muddying of the waters in the pre-invasion phase? I have called it gangster diplomacy. I, I, I do think that it was, um, at, the, at the time, perhaps giving the Russians a little too much credit of having, again, a very strategically coordinated concept for what was going to happen in Ukraine. And so the, 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 the thinking goes that uh, after you know, 15 years, really, of not doing anything on cybercrime, and the FBI has tried to work with security services in Russia for years, the FSB not getting anywhere, uh, that, that this was going to be a breakthrough, that the White House had worked with the, uh, the FSB to roll up some of these cyber criminal organizations. And uh, you know the cynics uh, or skeptics, maybe the better way to put it, um, myself included, were, th were thinking, "Hey, this is just this is a, a you know an olive branch, maybe that says, hey, don't worry about Ukraine. We can keep doing things over here 
with on cybercrime and make life easier back at home in the US. And this is what we met in Geneva about, right? This is what you talked to with, with the G7 countries. Um, but I don't, again, maybe it's early, but we haven't seen any sort of manifestation of that. But, but what it did establish to me was that all along, all along from the beginning, the Russian security services had the ability to put some kind of limitations on cybercrime. And in fact, the, the Kaseya group, the Our Evil hackers, I think, uh, I think DOJ announced today that they had extradited one from Ukraine now. So, to Texas. Oh. He was getting to know Dallas. There you go. Um, is he saying no Dessa? <laughs> so, but again, it speaks to just this bigger challenge of uh, ransomware in general is, is, you know, when you have a safe haven and a blind eye and um, really all ransomware was ultimately was operationalizing and monetizing misconfigured systems and, uh, and, and vulnerabilities in systems and sometimes just sometimes user error. And it, it got out of hand. So we need to talk about the, the thing you just pointed to, the, the responsibility on all of us to level up our defenses or as your successor, Jen Easterly would say, shields up. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that in a second. I want to keep the focus on the threat actors one yep. bit longer. So one of the, one of the biggest Russia haven groups would be Conti Group. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was fascinating to see <laughs> in the early days of the invasion, uh, there was sort of an official statement from some of the Conti Group saying, you know, we're if anyone messes with Russian infrastructure, we're going to, we are going to bring the fight to you. And then they discovered they have many Ukrainian uh, Patriots within their own organization, and someone doxed them and dumped all their logs. And now you can read all about it uh, through uh, Brian Krebs. Yes. Uh, Krebs on no security, the, the, the Conti diary for now. So, what do you think is going on here? Are we witnessing uh, sort of an internal, uh, as Pat Gray put it, an internal civil war within one of the major ransomware crews? And is that going to actually set back and do good for the ransomware threat once? This crisis starts really behind us, or is this just a temporary aberration? Once the Russia-Ukraine business resolves in some way, are we back to where we were six months ago? So I think I think what it shows is the cyber criminal underground in a kind of a, a muddy, fuzzy geopolitical space is complicated. It's intertwined. There are lots of different overlapping. I mean, there there you know rumors rumors. Uh, that there are U.S. operators in some of these ransomware groups, or Canadians. You know, it's, so it's not you know just a bunch of Muscovites. It's it's more complex than that. But to your point, I think what the last couple of weeks has done is really drawn some bright lines. And you know, there's 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 sides of history, and even criminals have a sense of you know humanity. Some have a sense of humanity about. It. But Conti is reestablished. And you know, I assume it's a it's a more you know Russian centric. But I'll tell, I'll tell you something else that was going on in that after that first Conti statement on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Eastern or whatever it was, some cybercom lawyers were pulling, <laughs> dusting off some uh, some authorization memos and saying, you know, does this change our interpretation? Of our ability to go after ransomware actors because the ostensibly non-state actors had just invited themselves in as contributing to the fight. I I mean it's just the the whether it, well we won't get into election stuff yet but like people just continuously violating the Stringer Bell rule like documenting your crimes like don't document your crimes. As a former litigator, I know <laughs> no one obeys that rule. Um, you know, to, to flip around uh, briefly, so Ukraine's information ministry put out a fascinating global call for volunteers to come to their aid, specifically calling for hackers, hackers of the world unite, come to our aid, here is a long list of Russian targets, we would really like you to go you know, DDoS and otherwise take down some of those targets. Uh, any reactions to that? Is, is, it, is it a mirror image of sort of this, this blurring of the state versus non-state and that civilian line. So I think this goes back to something I was trying to hit on that I'm not sure I do well at all. Um, 
is it really trying to put it, all this into context, right? So we can talk about cyber, why it happened, why it didn't happen. But again, this is this is small potatoes. There is there's you know, tragic events unfolding. Um, you know, every morning I, I can't, I, you know, I don't know about you, but it's kind of like check and see if Zelensky's still alive. Then you get your coffee. Like it just the the schedule of events is it, it, just a horrific uh, set of events that are um, unfolding. And you know, th there is a piece that we know something about, and so we tend to focus on. But we have to keep remembering and anchoring it against this this bigger tragedy. So as I sit here in Austin, Texas or Washington DC or wherever, I get very, very, very uncomfortable with this concept of the Ukrainian government asking for foreign, you know, mercenaries to come in and, and hack Russian uh, government operations and businesses. I just don't know where it's going to go and how things could be misinterpreted. What if they're, you know, not particularly skilled and they're, you know, using, you know, not cloaking in their activity yes, and they're, sure. they're beaming in from uh, Austin, Texas. You know, wh where does this all lead us? But then I put myself in the uh, seat of someone sitting in, in Kiev. I'm like, I want everyone that is able to help to help. Yeah. And I want the Russians to do it then. And so it's a, it's a, there's a, again, complex situation here. Um, but from a policy perspective, it, in having the luxury to examine the policy perspective. It is a very, uh, it, uh, it has a lot of potential to end up in some bad outcomes in particular because if in fact, um, as the political conditions deteriorate and some of the, again, those carefully constructed escalation considerations fall away, we don't know what the provocations could be. And so, the, you know, yes, somebody coming in from an IP address in, in, in the U.S. hitting Gazprom or Rosneft or something like that could be seen as, as an act of, act of war. Precisely. You're right, though. The moral, the moral clarity of, of the sympathies I think we all have for the, for the Ukrainians makes it hard to step back and say, well, hold on, you know, my fellow Americans before you get involved here. It feels, it feels morally thin. So, to try to just hurt people. Well, and, and just to be kind of now we're drifting a bit because we can. Um, the, the, the Ukrainians have played the information space amazingly well. And, and even with the, the MiG 29s from Poland to Ramstein Air Force Base in, in Germany, they did a really, they were very effective in cutting through and calling out bureaucratic. Processes. Yeah, a lot of <clears throat> yes. Paper. I need I need weapons not arrived at home or, or whipped out. So they that the whole information space around the invasion, whether it's the intelligence community's work uh, or just how the, the Ukrainians have played it, has been masterful. Well, let's pivot to that because the Russians who've been thinking for so long are such masters of the information game. And in in that space at least, they're they're getting blown out for the time being. Why are the Ukrainians so effective right now? And why are the Russians so uh, limited in what they've been able to achieve, or even perhaps trying to achieve? I don't, I don't know. It's, it's <laughs> uh, <laughs> there will be entire, you know, fellowships at the Strauss Center and every other <laughs> school that will be funded and dedicated just like, what happened here? So I, I, I skipped over it. I missed an entire section of my op-ed in my opening remarks. Um, why wasn't there cyber? And, and I, I don't know. I mean, yes, there was, but why wasn't, you know, gas pipelines and telecom? I mean, my assumption was that they were going to come in in the destabilization phase. They were going to knock out power. They were going to knock out pipelines. They were going to take down the internet. Uh, they were going to just blanket darkness. And they wanted a complete information blanket. Um, but that didn't happen. And, and what happened as a result? The iconic images of the invasion are Ukraines. The you know the the what is it, the uh, the babushka de la, de la muerta, right? <laughs> the, the grandmother of death with the sunflower seeds of the Russian troop. You know, put these in your pocket. You've got the ghost of Kiev. You know, the first ace since Korea or World War II, I guess. Uh, the thirteen heroes of Snake Island. Uh, the airport that was taken and retaken. Now you've got you know. 
Ukrainian farmers on John Deere tractors that'll have bigger, uh, you know, May Day parades than Moscow. It's it's um, it's remarkable how a whether it's strategic or tactical decision by Russians to leave the telecommunications networks up um, led to Ukraine winning the information war. So why did the Russians leave it up? I, I again don't know. Um, there are three kind of emerging intertwined theories. The first is that it kind of looks like Putin and his inner circle, which has gotten only smaller over the last couple of years, just didn't tell anybody with enough time to really effectively plan. And you're, you're seeing this in the logistics and supply chain piece um, of, the, of the ground war, but to conduct a, 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 an effective cyber network operation, it takes time. It can take months and months. It can take years to to plan it, to recon, to get access, to you know maintain persistence, and then achieve your your outcome when you need it. And look, if if they didn't tell things to get tell tell the FSB and the DRU and the SBR, which are the security services and intelligence apparatus, if they didn't give them about a couple months. Then they were left with really kind of kludgy, clunky things like the denial service and website defacements, um, or they had to repurpose existing access, which may not have been for a really high profile event, which may have left for that left us with whisper gate and, and hermetic wiper, which were two other destructive attacks, or they handed it off to the Belarusians, the, the ghostwriter team. So it, that's not clear. Um, I'm actually more of the mind that they actually assessed the situation. They thought they were going to do a thunder run straight up the highway to Kiev, and there wasn't going to be any resistance. And Zelensky was just going to go up to Munich for the Munich Security Conference and not come back. And it was just, and that was it, done and dusted. So why would we knock down the grid? Why would they knock down? Telecommunications network. Because <laughs> then you have to turn the lights back on. You have to fix things. Let's just just keep it turnkey. Um, I, I I mean that makes sense to me. And then the third that there's a lot of evidence emerging for this is that um, the Russians are actually dependent upon the Ukrainian telecommunications network for command and control, for calling back to Russia to, to say, hey, uh, the commander of the uh, uh, the tank regiment just got popped, and you know you know general. General Gerasimov, not that one, but the other one, got, <laughs> was killed. Um, so it, it just, it, there are all these different factors, but it, I think to your, to your point about the information war is that we've mythologized Russian military operations. We've mythologized their information operations. We've mythologized their cyber security, you know, their cyber attack capabilities and you know, there, there's going to be a lot of reflection on that um, and why that is, um, you know, w whether Eisenhower was right or whatever, but uh, ultimately they were not able to execute it, I think in part because the intelligence community did such an incredible job and like it's still, it, I am astonished by how quickly they were able to take intelligence that they'd picked up from the Russians, declassify it and release it into the public sphere. In some cases, I understand like 12 hours. In 2016, that would take a year or more. I mean, the NotPetya, uh, which was a, a Russian ransomware attack, or ransomware, wiper destructive attack that they launched from Ukraine in 2017. I think the attribution on that was six months or even longer. So, so the, the government's getting a lot better and, and that you can do things like that when you have clarity of purpose and strategic direction and the commands are given to execute like that. And, and what, what that did of calling out Putin, which is, you know, if you go back and you look at a couple of the press conferences at State Department, um, Ned Price, who's the spokesman, uh, said, was talking about it, and there was a reporter said, like, what evidence do you have? What, other than your words? And, you know, he probably, they probably could have released the information a little bit differently, but the point wasn't that they were trying to convince the U.S. that 
you know, US viewers that the Russians were about to do this. The point was to tell the, the walk-on music's now coming. <laughs> um, the, the point was to tell Putin that we know what you're planning, get inside his head. And as a result, what happened? They delayed some of the invasion. And so you have Russian troops, conscripts sitting at the border for an extra week, eating their food, <laughs> selling their fuel for vodka. And it was a, it was, you know, not just a strategic success, but a tactical success. Because now you, you literally have 10 columns that are running out of fuel, like 50 kilometers in. So it shows that that it's not just a good offensive, but it's a counteroffensive tool as well. If you can do it right, and they had, the US government had the right mentality, they had a strategic view, and they were proactive. And that's what's so different than 2020 even, and in 2016, is that we took the initiative. We, this shows like you know, the greatest disinfective, uh, disinfectant in the sunlight. So they got on top of that and it can be gained, of course. Um, you know, if the bad guys know where you're, you're stealing the info from, they can start inserting their own. Uh, US, you know, the allies did that in World War II uh, with some of the invasion plans. But, but look, I, I think there's a real dramatic shift in, in tactics and how we, we go up against Russia. The last thing I'll say here is that um, inoculation is also probably part of the part of the game. Like you expect Putin to do something. And so you know, here it comes, yeah, 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 here it comes, here it comes. And so we have a much more resilient uh, population here and elsewhere. And I think that's the key to solving a lot of the disinformation problem going forward is that you have to be built up steadily resilience and uh, thicker skin. We're still in the very, very early days of these internet-based disinformation uh, campaigns. And so we're, we're adjusting, we're humans, we'll adapt and evolve. And, and I think you know, we're slowly seeing it happen. That's interesting. That's sort of a public health model for how we uh, improve our current pathologies of disinformation. Um, yeah, well, uh, yes. Um, but sorry to, <laughs> like, see, I, you don't bring risk management consultants for fun, happy conversations. It's <laughs> like, oh, God. Uh, so the, the, one, uh, the, the one thing about disinformation operations in and of themselves, though, is that they're, they are, um, on the whole, they have the asymmetric advantage. The point is not to sell you on any one single point and convince you that that one thing happened. It's you flood the zone. You, you want as much there uh, so that the defenders can't defend and everyone else is just so overwhelmed. They're like, I don't even know what's true anymore. And so I need somebody to tell me what's wrong. Okay, that person's really, you know, <laughs> authoritative looking, sounding, and, and really believes in what they're saying. So maybe I'll listen to them. How it kind of works. Well, on that happy note, I'd like to open it up for questions <laughs> from the audience. I, I have a lot of questions of my own, but I want to be fair and include all of y'all. So who would like to break the ice by going first? Yes. Um, I wondered, all the coverage says that there's virtually no news getting through to the folks who live in Moscow, who live in Russia, and with the you know just increasing clamp down by the Russians on what their own people are hearing, how do you see that breaking through? Who who fixes that? How do we start having the you know BBC broadcasts snuck into the French homes at night, uh, like we did during World War II? How, how do you how do you break through and really build the the internal resistance? Well, I you know there still is Radio for Europe, and that's the State Department program. Um, the you know, it's not always about information, it's about the lived experiences. <laughs> and, you know, when the shelves are empty, um, that starts sending a signal, a powerful signal that something's amiss. And I, it's hard to say, at least based on where I sit, what I've seen of what the real support is. I've seen numbers like, ah, 60% don't support this. But then you see the Russian gymnast, you know, on the podium with the Z. So I, I don't know what to make of, of whether there's 
widespread support or widespread opposition. Uh, but but I mean that that's what's so sad about this is that the Russian people, this isn't them. They don't, they don't have any bone to pick there. It's, it's leadership for the last 20 plus years have increasingly set up this conflict. And again, I think that this is probably you know, that that market, that economy is you know closed. I, I can't imagine a major US consumer brand going back into Russia in a forced, you know, forceful way under the current regime. Any sanctions or not, it just reputationally it, it can't be done. So um, I mean it really does have kind of echoes of of the early 80s uh, Soviet Union. First, we've not had the privilege of meeting before. I'm Bob Inman. Um, you wear a badge of courage and honor, having gotten pushed out for telling the truth um, toward the end of your government time. And we greatly admire what you did in building. Now, having said the nice things, <laughs> <laughs> oh, here we go. My whole attitude has changed in the last 48 hours mm -hmm. in watching the bombing of the hospitals and the rest of it. And knowing Putin's Chechnya, then to Georgia, then to Crimea, now here. This is just another step along his way. When are we going to decide to confront instead of conceding? And I've reached the point now where I believe we need to declare a no-fly zone, at least where there are any possibility of civilians being killed in the process. So I'm not, a, you know, I didn't, I didn't serve in the military, um, and I'm not a, you know, military strategist. So, you know, I don't know if a no-fly zone, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I do need to protect. I agree. So that's that's where I'm landing on all this is, you know, we constantly say never again, right? And yet it sure as hell seems like something's happening there. And I don't know the policy in those those principal committees and the cabinet meeting, what the decisions are. It sure looks to me like Ukraine's punching well, well, well above its weight. And it's got some of the whether it's the stingers or the javelins, and they're making you know uh, pretty pretty short work of the Russians, but the Russians have numbers; they can continue to throw. So I don't know what the calculus is. I don't know what the what their what the international community is willing to allow happen. But I think we're I, I'm, I'm with you. Something different. Has, there has to be some change. You know, again, I think everybody's frustrated with the MiG twenty nine. <laughs> Uh, issue again, not understanding the bureaucracy behind it. Sure, didn't seem like it was a, that was an effective approach, but um, I, I just I, I it has I have a hard time sitting here and just figuring out what where this goes next. Um, but again, none of it's good. Hi there, thanks for coming. My name is Christopher Shafiq. I'm a student here. And my question is, you said that the value of cyber operations are in the gray zone. And now we're in hot, or Ukraine and Russia, of course, in a hot war. Is there, and you also said that a, a cyber attack is, a, is an act of war. So is there any way we can remain in the gray zone doing some sort of cyber operations that is not attributable? What, what, what sort of, what, what can we do to, to, to just make it a little bit more cost, uh, raise the cost on, on, on the Russians, but yet not cross that threshold of being, uh, you know, being an act of war? So I have the, um, the honor of not getting classified briefings anymore, which is, uh, <laughs> I, I never particularly enjoyed it. There's a lot of uh, responsibility that comes along with that, including when you go out in public, you can speak. As much as I did in my role, so sort of you're like, okay, this part of my brain is the classified part of my brain. <laughs> like, it, it, it. There's a lot of kind of constant checking. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, but you know, I, I have to believe right now that Cyber Command is actively engaging, whether 
you know, in coordination with Ukrainians or in support of Ukrainian efforts in defense of, you know, going after some of the, the actors, Belarus and Russia, some of the actors, um, you know, going after some of the disinformation operations as well, getting intelligence, getting information. You know, all that stuff is, is well within the gray zone, I think, right now. I think once you start moving out into something that's much more hostile is hitting civilian infrastructure in, in Russia. And that was, you know, you will hear some policymakers say like, you know, we really need to wake them up. We need to shut down the grid around Moscow for, you know, 30 minutes or something. Um, so, I, you know, the, the, the issue though here is that even though it's war in Ukraine and things are very tense and uh, Europe and elsewhere, like we're still raising them here. I mean, there's still ransomware hack attacks happening every day. So that's, I think, part of the escalation that the US government's been concerned about as a game plan that we're you know, working all this stuff out over the last several months, you know, really six months probably is, you know, as things continue to escalate, as environment is, political and economic conditions degrade in, in Russia, what, if, what does that change in the calculus? So it could be the, the gangs that, Ra, uh, that Bobby was tell, talking about, um, maybe they're like, hey, you're, you're, you're out of jail, go do some badness. That's one of them. Um, there could be maybe uh, some sort of covert action uh, against <coughs> banks. So we're hitting their banks pretty hard. Maybe they come after our banks and not, you know, just like hitting the ATM networks, but start messing with like wholesale payment and some of the, some of the stock market issues that we've had in the past. So th there's space and that's, again, that's why there are people in government that get paid to really think through these things and then go work with the, work with the, the defenders. And that's what the government's been doing for, again, months and months and months is they've identified the areas that the adversary has been before they've hit before, and then we know we might provoke them from uh, you know, any sort of sanction. But the challenge is you can do all that hardening of the bank, of the financial services sector, energy grid, transportation, logistics, all that stuff, but then ransomware comes in and ransomware is off of the list. It, 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 you know, it could be anywhere. I mean, 23 counties in Texas a couple of years ago. Um, it, it's, it's, it's opportunistic, it's constantly scanning. A lot of it on the front end is automated. It then flips over to a human powered ransomware operation. So um, it, there's a lot of gray zones still. Um, and to just kind of close it out, it's like the, we, we've heard constantly from NATO about Article 5, how with the London Protocol or whatever, that Article 5 includes a cyber attack. And, and I, you know, I'm Okay, well, what's the definition of, of cyber attack here? You know, what's the response? Because the language in Article Five is um, response would, uh, you know, maintain and restore stability and security. Okay, what does that look like in a ransomware attack or, or, or in a cyber attack? You know, they they hit the grid in in Paris, for instance. Does that mean we go in? No, you, you take down the infrastructure. Is that it? Are there sanctions? The other piece being, there's not necessarily a cyber for cyber response. There can be other actions that are coming. So, and some you may not even see. I'll jump into the question on real quick. I want to take this a little bit away from the Russian Ukraine topic. Mm -hmm. Drew, go back to uh, something that was a key feature of your success at CISA, which was presiding over what is, is clearly a very successful effort to protect the security of our elections. Now we've got another upcoming election in the short term, and then a presidential election, not yeah. too far off the horizon for the election cycle. Um, how are you feeling about the cybersecurity dimensions? Not necessarily the disinformation dimension, that's a larger, fuzzier problem, but cybersecurity dimensions. Um, are you feeling good? Are you anxious? And, and how does the variation over time of what adversaries want out of their appearance factor into that? So just from like a, a general, risk level, midterms are always kind of about mid-range concern. Because it's harder to find that one thing you really want to mess with or an outcome you want to affect. Presidentials, much flashier, much more attention, much more media coverage. 
uh, and you may or may not want to affect that single outcome. So it kind of looks like that, and then you know afterward it drops off, and then it builds back up. So from a pure election security perspective, splitting it out as Bobby has into the election infrastructures of the systems, and then you have the disinformation problem, which can affect the systems, but also just the, the broader political environment. If you just focus on election infrastructure, I have always viewed that as the easier of the two. Because it's, it's by definition a technical problem. It's an engineering challenge that we could solve for with money, time, effort, people, all that stuff. Uh, the the ra reality is, though, is you never have enough of any of that. Uh, but the difference between 2016 and 2020, we did have a lot of money. The Congress allocated over a billion dollars out through the Help America Vote Act. We had the attention. We had all 50 states working together. Once we established that, in fact, there was a legitimate threat in 16, and, and there, there well could be coming back in 2020. So we, we, we had the money. We had the, the people and the attention. We had the engagement. And so 2020, the confidence we had in the 2020 election was really built on the fact that we, we felt like we had a good understanding of what the adversary capabilities and, and more, more importantly, what their intent and interests were. We knew that we had improved the resilience of the systems. I think the best example is that I talk about all the time is uh, paper ballots. So in 2016, about eh, right around 80% of votes cast out of ver voter verifiable paper audit trail paper ballot associated with it. 2020, it was like 95%. And the importance there is that you're not relying on a software or computer to dictate the outcome. You have an auditable record that you can go back and count. Georgia did it uh, a few times. Um, <laughs> uh, I will tell you this though, in 2016, Georgia and Pennsylvania were uh, DRE, so I have a few of those here in Texas and some counties. Um, but you just touch the screen and your vote stored down on removable media. It's really hard to audit that in a transparent way. Georgia and Pennsylvania in 2016 were both DRE states, along with South Carolina, Delaware, uh, New Jersey, a direct recording equipment machine. So you touch it, it's on a piece of. Uh, yep. Um, so at this point, the only state that's total DRE is Louisiana. They've tried now twice to switch over, but they come run into contracting problems. Um, and, and Texas has a couple of counties, Indiana, Tennessee, and a few others. But, but again, Pennsylvania and Georgia flip from DREs to ballot marking devices. So you touch the screen, uh, a printer head marks the, the piece of paper and uh, spits out the ballot. Now there's still some kind of uh, security concern around that, but nonetheless, they had the ballot. They could go back and, and check. They did it three times. If it was not, if they were still on DREs in 2020, there's no way I would have been as confident as we were, just because they they counted it and the vote was consistent. And then we had other partnerships. We had uh, physical. So those all those things generally still remain. Training technology improvements. I want to see as much 100% uh, of, of paper ballots as possible. I will have more post-election pre-certification real audits. Um, and uh, I think technically, I think, I think that, that puts us in a much better spot. The challenge is going to be though, something that I, that I was always worried about, didn't think we had to worry about, is insider threat. So yes, we have to worry about foreign adversaries, but now we also have politically motivated uh, election officials that come in for an express purpose of, of manipulating an outcome. Um, there was a uh, Mesa County, Colorado, one of the, the county clerk of elections was just indicted um, 17 counts, I think 11 plus six, or uh, maybe they're accomplice for six. But it, you know, that gives me some heartburn. That's one of those, I think if you talk to the election security community right now, one of the, the biggest concerns is the, is the insider threat. It's the, it's the election official that, that uh, just not have, you know, is not approaching it in good faith. But given how many sort of career, dispassionate, uh, disinterested, nonpartisan career election officials are 
explaining to us that they evolved or could be useful. Right. Part of more of the spots that they got the open. Well, and, and then you ha you actually have candidates for statewide office, including uh, Secretary of State in Georgia, um, Georgia, uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, Nevada, and Arizona that that are that have some of them have publicly said I would not have certified for this position. What I'm trying to say is apolitical down the road here. It's like that is on the record they've said I would not have certified. So, so another happy note yeah. to turn back to the audience. The more cheer. Oh, my wife loves bringing me to parties. <laughs> so I have a question regarding China. Uh, while all this is going on with Russia and Ukraine, uh, I work for a cybersecurity vendor with public first public breaches uh, many years ago. You can have to uh, and it was China, but anyway, I didn't say that. Um, what does China do right now? What do you think China is doing? We're watching all of this go on. And I suppose the follow-up question is, why do you think financial so much? I wore the wrong socks. Um, so, you know, just the same thing, like I said, with, with Russia is it, it's not, it's obviously it's the government, it's the security services we're concerned about. Same thing goes with, with uh, the Chinese Communist Party and their security services. That's the challenge that we face. Uh, the, they have numbers, so the security services uh, all up, you know, total headcount is greater than the five eyes, so UK, uh, US, Canada, uh, Australia, New Zealand, of their security services combined. So they have numbers, uh, they can brute force things, but they're very, very good, very skilled, um, and they've used uh, their capabilities for, I think to your point, intellectual property, theft, you know, basically hoovering up whatever they can, and then they commercialize that. Which is which is which is dramatically different. They commercialize intellectual property. So they, their security services come in and they'll take intellectual property and they hand it over to national champions. That is something that the U.S. government does not do. Like full stop. That was part of an agreement between President Obama and President Xi back in 2013. Uh, and, and that that stands true. Whether there are other Western government, governments that do that, it's not my area of expertise, but. That is that's how uh, that's how the, the Ministry of State Security, for instance, works. And what they've done is they've established through uh, through you know effectively their five year plan. So the main China twenty twenty five plan, they've established the strategic sectors that they want to dominate in the global economy. Good for them. I mean, great. I think everybody should make their investments and commitments to dominate a space. Uh, but through a combination of you know questionable trade practices, Huawei tends to be the the, the big company of interest there. But also, again, going out there, having a targeting list based on these are the strategic sectors and it's advanced uh, agribusiness, life science, uh, you know, fuel cell research, uh, industrial automation, I mean, kind of see where we're going from the industry for the future. Uh, the, the security services have a shopping list. You go out and get this, 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 this. And so from a, you know, particularly sitting here in Austin with you know, Dell and NXP, it's really, High performing uh, in terms of technology uh, companies, you know, there's a lot of value in the data that, that's sitting around here. And, and that's why companies have to understand where they sit in the global value chain. What part of the economy they're contributing? How important are you? You may not have an operating presence in another country, you may just be feeding up into you know, a single component. into uh, an integrator down the road. But if you're part of the bigger semiconductor value chain, guess what? You're, you're on that. Um, and, and that's why what's dramatically changed from a cyber targeting perspective over the, um, and Wendy, if you have like a bingo chart, like every cyber thing I'm saying, I'm probably getting close to bingo, but um, the, where it used to be the big banks, the defense industrial based companies, the higher technology companies 10 years ago that were getting targeted. Now there's a lot more targeting throughout the supply chain. So you see these mid market companies that are maybe a you know, billion, two billion in revenue or cap that, that don't, that have only been around for 10 years, that have grown up organically, organically through corporate development, mergers and acquisitions. So they don't have fully fleshed out security programs that can match what you find in. In Microsoft or Google, 
uh, and, and it's really becoming uh, attractive targets for sophisticated state operators to get the supply chain optimized. Um, so the, it, it's, it, it really is increasingly becoming that every company is a software company and every company therefore is on the map. They're on the targeting list. In the, again, don't bring me to parties. Um, this is going to be the rest of human existence. Technology is not you know, going away. Um, we're only getting more and more of it integrated into our lives. Close your eyes, think about you know, five years down the road, think about your car, think about your home. I mean, we all saw the documentary Back to the Future too, right? Like we saw all the stuff that was in their homes. Um, hopefully we don't go as far as idiocracy, but you know, there's, there's a lot of space between those two. Uh, but you know, things that are in our body, on our person, you know, it just the surveillance economy is gonna explode, the ability to get in there and uh, operationalize it. So, so what, was, what used to be, again, a technical risk that was pushed down somewhere in, um, you know, in the, in the IT shop, in the CIO shop 10 years ago. So man, the big Mandiant news the other day was getting bought. Mandiant's an incident response company established uh, by uh, Kevin Mandia in 2007. A little old thing, he was early to the market. And now it's a $5 billion pickup by Google. I mean, it's massive, but it just shows you how much things can change in 10 to 15 years. And just thinking 10 to 15 years out, we don't even know, but, but look, it's, this is it. Yes. You teed up on my favorite question. So, is the market going to take care of this? Is this Asian? Is it going to take care of it quickly enough? Or is this, are you making a case for more regulatory intervention or some other type of intervention to force the private sector to invest more in defense? Um, I think the market will sort out, but the market doesn't react overnight, right? Um, th there are intervention points for the federal government. That are really easy picking. So, you know, the, there is actually, in, particularly for non publicly traded companies uh, in the United States, unless you have a privacy issue, uh, you know, personally identifiable information. But if you have, if you're non publicly traded and, um, and, and you have a, a compromise and someone stole some intellectual property, you don't really have to tell anybody. And that's kind of a problem. That's why we got a ransomware problem. Because people were having issues, they didn't tell anybody. They were trying to hide it because they didn't want exposure to shareholders, to clients. They didn't want the public reputational damage. And it, we don't even understand with ransomware the denominator. We don't know how bad it is. And so there's a piece of legislation that passed the Senate. Um, I think it's gotten looped into the continuing yeah the spending bill that would for a segment of industry, so critical infrastructure, government contractors, a few others, that would require instant notification within a set period of time uh, to CISA. And uh, you know, I think to me that, that you know, it's bare minimum. And then the Securities and Exchange Commission just yesterday uh, released some updated guidance on notification. Four-day rules for public yeah. trade. Yeah. So, you know, conflicts, and you'll have to figure that part out, you know, Government needs, that's the worst part, frankly, for the private sector. And I'll get back to your question. Like, it's actually really hard for the private sector to work with the federal government because the federal government can't, there, there's so many equities and funding streams and congressional co uh, committees and support. Like, well, if you have an incident, you need to call SIS of the FBI field office and if you're publicly traded, the SEC. Like, you know, if, if you have a security team of two people, how do, how, do you, how do you manage it? The government needs to have an easy button for this stuff, but, it, but it's complicated. So the market, um, I think in some respects, yes, the market has failed. Uh, I, you know, there's a lot of like, why, why don't we just have software, um, uh, you know, have strict liability as well. Well, I, that's impossible. So, you know, you just have any flaw and you can sue them, you know, as a product liability issue. It's one of the few areas, software is one of the few areas that I'm aware of where you have an intelligent adversary continuously poking for vulnerabilities and finding new things on a daily basis. Okay, fine. So let's establish what a best practice looks like, some kind of standard for a certain class of software. And, and if you don't do that, then now you have some negligence cases that you know, there's some cause of action. 
there. So I think, I think there's some legal recourse. I think government contracting is another way to really dramatically improve the quality of software that we, that we all use. Uh, the government, US government is one of the biggest purchasing purchaser of software and uh, IT services in the world. The Department of Defense is probably the biggest, particularly of like Microsoft. Um, so when the government says, you must be this high or tall to, to contract, there's a cascading effect in the industry. So the government needs to do more of that. The executive, there was an executive order last year that, that kind of raised the bar. I suspect those were also drafted so that like, you know, Google it would all easily meet it. But you know, that banks buy the same stuff. State governments buy the same stuff. You know, small consulting firms buy the same stuff. That, that it matters. So that's, we're gonna get better outcomes there. And then I suspect that there'll be some harmonization of regulations that exist. But ultimately where we have to go is, you know, 1939 FDR has given the ability to, you know, remake the government in a more effective image for the, the facts of you know, the environment that existed in the prelude to World War II. I think basically the way we use technology now has so fundamentally changed the government's roles and responsibilities that we need to rethink the way that the government's organized. I think it's well past time for a US digital agency. Privacy, there's no federal privacy law. So there's 50 different states and all that good stuff. So I think, I think there is some room now in this political climate, do I think they could pull something like that off? Maybe not. But it's tough. So in the meantime, we have CISA, which you were probably yes. contributing for. And uh, does it need new authorities so it can be more? Capable? Has it gotten recently the authority that needed? So CISA is a uh, part of the Department of Homeland Security. It's a cybersecurity and infrastructure security agency. Uh, we like security so much it's in our name twice. Um, I didn't really have a lot of influence in the name, but it's better than National Protection Programs Directorate. Like we literally go to job fairs and have that banner up and it's like, what the hell is that? So, uh, but CISA, like cyber, okay, got it. I know what you do. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an agency with authorities uh, that are the most forceful on the, the federal agency side, where you can buy tools, deploy tools, and, and, and conduct operations. But on the private sector side, even with state and local, it's a purely voluntary public-private partnership type orientation. So we can't really force anybody to do anything. And that's what I tried in that job to, to, to reinforce and emphasize was we're, we're really like a startup. You know, we, we have to understand what the market needs. But we can't give them something that they can get better, cheaper, or whatever elsewhere. Uh, so focus on what the gaps are, understand what the needs are, and where we have a leadership role come in and, and, and bring a product that they would want to use and they would get value from. And elections was a perfect example. And we understood what the challenges are. We didn't mess around. We didn't have any, anything to add. Um, and, and ultimately kind of lifted the... The, the baseline. Now, there are some areas where they have more compulsory authorities, of late at least, the administrative subpoena um, authority. And that's basically, uh, you can go out there and use tools to scan the internet and look for vulnerable devices. One of them is called Shodan. And you can find that there's some sort of industrial control system equipment that's connected to the internet that's exploitable. It has a bug in it that's known, it's patched. But when you try to figure out, okay, who owns that? Well, that's not how the internet works, right? It's not like you've got a system in your warehouse that you then slap a digital label on and broadcast the internet. It actually, it kind of terminates at whoever the internet service provider is. So you can find the thing and you double click on it. You're like, ah, Verizon, okay. Now under the Sword Communications Act, Verizon can't just turn that information over to the government potentially sensitive personal information, they have to be subpoenaed for it. Subpoenas have to follow a, privacy, a, a, a policy and privacy. There are exceptions and there are law enforcement agencies that have that subpoena authority, CISA did not. So we worked for a couple of years to get that subpoena authority just a year and a half ago, CISA got it. And what happens is that when they identify a particularly concerning vulnerable system connected to the internet, they can serve a subpoena on uh, the internet service provider and um, and be provided contact information by which they can go uh, inform whoever owns that device 
uh, that it's vulnerable. And so that, that's an example of a, a new authority that I think is helpful. It's been used by SIS, I think, to great, to, you know, great success. Uh, and then beyond that, I think the big question comes on the regulatory side. You know, what are SIS's regulatory authorities, if any? I think the prevailing logic is, and wisdom is, if you start turning towards the regulatory side, with the dark side, of course, <laughs> um, you know, you, you, you're not going to have a lot of engagement on the voluntary side. People are going to be frankly scared of information, or share information. Get one last question before we turn everybody loose. So where's the next one? Let's go to the back. It's easy to overlook the back. We've got hands up in the back. And so uh, I'll just go over up the aisle and we'll let you two decide since you're sitting next to each other. You can merge the questions. <laughs> That's right. She's prettier than me. So. <laughs> um, you had mentioned about the legislation for the mandatory reporting. Um, and this may be a very quick answer, but how does the government plan on enforcing that? They'll figure that out in a Administrative Procedures Act regular uh, rulemaking process. And that's that's the kind of interesting thing is that even if that law was passed tomorrow, it would still take probably 18 months for the APA process to play out. I don't think they've got a national security exception. So it takes a, it takes a long time. So from so then that's obviously from a legislative perspective, but I mean how how would it work? Yeah. So um, having been a part of a <laughs> regulatory, setting up a regulatory process, um, the, you know, first off, you have to define the process, the mechanism by which the reporting comes, then all the back-end protections have to be put in place to protect any sensitive data. But to, I suspect what would happen is there would have to be a very, very, very significant and painful outreach and engagement process. So that those who should know, know, and this is conferences, trade uh, bulletins, this is people in the field going out there and talking, this is going to be briefing uh, boards of directors and, and working with uh, legal teams and, and lawyers to inform them that here are the requirements is what you do. There are always going to be people that are just like, I never heard that. You know, I just, I, I didn't. There's, there's a chemical security regulation uh, the DHS, it's just a, a implements, and they still to this day come across companies that handle dang, you know, dangerous chemicals that they're like, I don't even know what this regulatory program is, and it's been in place for 15 years. So uh, you, it, there's going to have to be a probably a mens rea aspect to really get a enforcement action where you because the the penalties are. Uh, I think the requirement is still to be determined, maybe anywhere from 24 to 72 hours. But at one point, it was like half, what is it, a half a percent of, of annual uh, revenue for, per day. It was, it was an insane amount of money. GDPR was. Yeah, it's, it, but, you know, that's how you have to do it. Well, but the thing that lurks in the background of that is it's a question of, okay, so once this is out there, the enforcement authority is there, there's not compliance. When do they first make an example of somebody? It better be a very egregious case that they want you to look at and think, yeah, that's, that's outrageous. And will they then spread out from the egregious cases yeah. to where they start to be tough? I, you know, go, go ask the uh, FTC on Wyndham. I'll have to yeah, what works there. Exactly. Uh, folks, we need to let our friend off the hot seat. Let's all uh, say thanks to Chris Crouch for having <laughs>